Talent does not exist, at least not in the way we think of it when we hear it thrown around in our daily lives. And I think the idea of talent is overall a negative one that uh, makes us think worse of ourselves and what we're capable of achieving. I've heard so many people write themselves off and say, you know, I, I'd love to be a, a guitar player or a graphic designer or a YouTuber, but I just don't have the talent, right? I don't have whatever it is that that other more successful person has. I wasn't born with it. So I may as well not try. And if you've ever said something like that to yourself, I'm going to try and convince you that you probably do, in fact, have at least what it takes to be successful at whatever it is you want to achieve. And I'm not trying to glaze you up and give you unrealistic expectations of what's possible to achieve in one lifetime. You know, I'm not out here to say you can make a billion dollars and be a doctor and be an astronaut. Not, none, none of that. I, I really do think that most people are, are just underestimating what they're capable of. And I want to speak up about it. The way I like to think about talent is that we use the word talent when we see someone do something we think is awesome but we don't know what other words to use to explain how they were able to do it. For example, when you were in the school play as a kid or marching band or football or whatever it was, your grandparents might have come to your play or to the game and after you performed well or won the game, they might have said, oh, my grandson is so talented, right? Well, you don't feel talented in that moment. You feel like a normal kid who showed up to practice every day until it was performance or game day and then you just did what you had been doing, except this time your grandparents Parents were there to see it and call you talented. And that's the simple truth of it. Talent is what people who show up for one day use to describe people who show up every day. And that's all cool in the gang and something you might hear in a graduation speech or on a cereal box or something. But a lot of you are probably calling bullshit because there were probably other kids you, that you remember who stepped onto the field or the stage and it was like they got it, right? It was like they were born to act or play football or whatever. And while in hindsight, you probably didn't know what those kids were doing before you met them, whether they were taking music lessons since they were a toddler or, you know, playing catch with their dad. At the end of the day, you are going to meet people that just seem to, you know, quote unquote, be a natural at whatever it is. Some people are naturally fast runners. Some are really strong and some are born with two tails that they can spin like a helicopter and fly. And it's true, we're all different in ways that we can't control, right? And a lot of that is determined at birth. Your genetics and brain chemistry and all the external factors that determine how your body and mind functions do set your limitations and your capabilities different than mine or anybody else's. All I'm trying to convince you of today is that an quote unquote natural aptitude makes up much less of your potential than you think. It starts with stepping away from comparison. You probably already know that you shouldn't compare yourself to others. You've heard it all before, right? Compare yourself not to others, but to who you were yesterday. And yes, it's healthy to learn every day and keep iterating on your craft and keep improving at who you are. But my hot take is that it's not worth comparing yourself to yourself at any given time in your life. There's basically nothing different about comparing yourself to who you used to be to comparing yourself to another person. Because that person you were yesterday, you know, they're a different person. They ate a different lunch than you. They had different thoughts, a different experience on the drive to work. You have a lot in common with them, but you exist and they're just a memory. I remember a time when uploading YouTube videos was easy for me. I was excited to post every day. I had all this motivation. I was posting like three videos a week. And after about a year of that, I was burnt out to the absolute max. I eventually overcame that burnout and I might tell that story in another video. That was years ago and I still have not reached the same motivation and output that I had back then. And a few years ago, it just clicked for me that that's okay. I don't get to decide when I feel motivated. And it's clear that what I was doing back then wasn't sustainable. And now I'm God damn it. And now that I'm approaching my creative pursuits with much more control, I'm finding YouTube so much more rewarding, both spiritually and materially. Thank you guys so much for watching that most recent video so much. God damn it, Tails. And in a way, that's still a comparison to who I was before, but it's about perspective, right? I stopped comparing myself to what I had going for me in the past and started evaluating what I need in the present. Maybe this should have been the Sonic CD video instead of the Sonic 2 video. Yeah, fuck you, Tails. That's worth pointing out that people who are the absolute best at what they do are often getting there by comparing themselves to others. Nobody ever got silver in the Olympics and felt the exact same feelings that they would have if they had won the gold. They might feel 99% of the same feelings. They might be overwhelmed with pride and joy and, and, you know, in themselves for trying their hardest, but 
Nobody gets to the Olympics by keeping their eyes on a silver medal. But at the same time, if we're keeping it real, if keeping your eyes on gold was all it took to get you to the Olympics, more people would be competing there. The unfortunate truth is that most Olympians have both an obsessive level of dedication and a genetic and circumstantial predisposition for their bodies to be a perfect fit for their sport. Something can take hard work and have to be earned and be a privilege at the same time. I, being a twink and at the age I'm at now, will never be a gold medalist in hammer throw or a professional linebacker. But if I really set my mind to it, I could probably be way better at hammer throw or football than I ever thought I could be, and maybe even compared to most people. Because as you probably know, winning isn't everything. You don't have to be the very best that no one ever was to contribute something meaningful. Your favorite song was probably not written by the greatest musician who ever lived if su such a person even exists. There have most certainly been times in your life where even if you didn't end up the best, you ended up way better at the thing than you ever imagined. And you can probably look back at that moment that you realized how far you had come with a lot of pride. I've decided I like using the game I'm playing during these videos to illustrate my example, but Sonic, for all I love about the series, is kind of terrible at making this point. Everyone in the Sonic series has the abilities they do because they were made or born that way, and we don't really see anyone really earning anything. Tails, up until about Sonic, Sonic Heroes is the only exception I can really think of. Yes, he was born with two tails, but from birth it would just be a deformity, and instead he's inspired by Sonic to use what makes him unique to achieve great things and defeat evil and all that. For a better example, let's go full nerd and talk Dungeons and Dragons. I actually know a thing or two about D&D unlike RuneScape, which a few of you from the last video were keen to point out. When you make your character in D&D, you have what are called ability scores, and this this serves as a way to quantify your character's abilities, if you will. You know, their, their strength, their intelligence, intelligence, their charisma, dexterity, all that. And these scores serve as sort of the basis for how good your character is at everything they do. Having an 18 in strength would make you a quote unquote better barbarian than somebody with a nine in strength, for example. But someone with a nine in strength might have a 17 in intelligence and make a great wizard. But what's interesting is that as you level up and you become a level 15 wizard or barbarian, the ability scores you start with matter less and less. Yeah, at level one, a plus four to damage, thanks to a high strength score, makes a big difference from plus three. But but at level 20, a plus 24 to damage over a plus 23 isn't really going to make a difference in most situations. And the important thing to recognize there is no matter where your quote unquote natural talent is where you start, you're going to suck compared to anyone with significantly more experience than you, even if they lack that natural talent. And you're going to suck compared to what you'll be when you gain that experience. You have to suck before you can succeed. And this reflects what it's like in real life. When we're born, we don't get to pick the ability scores we start with if you will. Some of us build muscle easily and then, you know, there's me. Some of us are naturally outgoing and well-spoken and some of us are shy and introverted. Intelligence is actually up in the air. I actually have seen pretty good evidence that IQ is essentially a myth, but from a practical sense, there are people who say learn things in school, uh, in a school environment more easily than others. So we, we might feel like we're not, oh my God, what the fuck just happened there? So we might feel like we're not as naturally, you know, quote unquote smart or as gifted as other people, you know. But you probably heard the phrase at some point, uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And in this case, what that means is your quote unquote natural talent or aptitude for something really only helps you to get the ball rolling at the beginning more than it helps you reach the absolute top. Some things are gonna come more easily for others and some things are gonna come more easily for you. But what's important is that everyone reaches a point where it's no longer easy anymore. For me, when I was in school, math came really easily. I aced algebra without really having to practice or study. And then I got all the way to calculus and I completely and totally shit the bed. It was like I slammed a race car into a brick wall. Integrals completely mind fucked me. And the equations finally got too complicated for me to memorize just from seeing them. And before I knew it, the kids who were worse than me at algebra were better than me at calculus. And it's because the kids who had trouble in algebra had to develop good study habits to be successful. And those good habits and hard work carried over into calculus. And while I was good at math, I just seemed to be terrible at every physical sport, even the ones that really aren't physically demanding. Uh, in high school, I got kicked off the golf team. The golf team. And in college, I once taught a girl how to play ping pong, and then in her very first game, she beat me. I have a natural aptitude at math, and if I really loved math, I probably could do some really cool stuff with it. But I don't love math. In fact, I really hate doing math problems. But I love ping pong. There's gonna be things in your life that you're good at that you have really no interest in pursuing. And there's gonna be things you really love and really want to do and you're gonna suck at them. 
and that's okay. The first step is accepting what you're like definitely never going to be capable of. And this can be hard and it can put you in a negative mindset. So start with things you definitely don't care about. For example, I have terrible vision and uh, while I can go about my daily life just fine uh, with my glasses, I'll, I'll never be able to become a fighter pilot, for example. They literally will not let me fly fighter planes if I can't pass a vision test, which is fine since I definitely don't see myself joining the military by choice. <laughs> People who are born deaf will probably never be musicians. But while music is so important to me, and I feel sad thinking about people who will never experience what I have with music, I think about them watching me play guitar and it probably looks pretty funny. <laughs> I must look pretty silly. There's a conversation to be had here about uh, disability and accessibility and all that. Um, but as, as privileged as I am enough to wear glasses and, and take medication that mitigates my disabilities, I don't know that I'm really qualified to lead that discussion. So I think we should probably just listen more to people with disabilities that aren't as accommodated as they could be. So once you've gotten over that initial hurdle of giving something up, even if it, oh, God damn it. Once you've given something up and you're kind of over that, that initial hump, even if it's just one thing, then you can move on to things that you might be a little bit more attached or invested in that you know you're going to have to give up at some point. This is the hard part because we have a lot of dreams and a lot of ambitions and goals in our life and we want to do them all. We want to be an astronaut and a guitar hero and a star quarterback and cure cancer, right? I found it really difficult to give up golf. It took three years of literally getting the lowest score possible in every tournament I competed in and the coach setting me down and being like, homie, there has got to be a better use of your time because I still enjoyed it and it helped me connect with my grandpas, but I spent just as good time with them doing stuff that wasn't golf. And I still hit a cheeky chip at Top Golf with my girlfriend's family every once in a while and get to play putt putt with my friends. When it came to ping pong, I eventually just accepted I was terrible um, and kept playing anyway. And I made a ton of friends just being confident in myself and laughing along with the jokes we made at my expense and giving the other homies that weren't as good an ego boost when they could beat me without really trying. But I'm not in college anymore and I don't play ping pong and I don't golf. And while sometimes I miss them, I don't regret spending my time pursuing things that I love just as much if not more that I find more rewarding and I'm actually capable of improving hat sorry to any of you hidden palace enjoyers I I really cannot stand hidden palace in uh, in the real release of this game I, I really just hate the boss the boss takes like 20 minutes to kill and I'm, I'm just not about it that being said if it let me skip oil ocean I'd definitely do it because man I hate this zone too you know in my last video I, I talked about spider-man 2 and, and how great it was and how applicable it was to life and all that but uh, one part of that movie I really left out that I that I couldn't really find a way to fit in was a really great part where where uh, Peter's talking to his aunt and she's giving him this advice and she's telling him and, and she doesn't know he's Spider-Man, but she clearly knows he's Spider-Man, right? She's like, you know, sometimes in order to be a hero, we have to, to give up the thing we want the most, even our dreams. And I never really knew what to do with that as a kid because it, it didn't seem like he was giving up his dreams, right? Isn't it his dream to be Spider-Man? It's like, well, no, his dream was to be Peter Parker, really. And you know, sometimes we do have to give up our dreams in life in order to be who we need to be. I can't say that I never wanted to be a good ping pong player and maybe win a ping pong tournament or, or being a decent golfer, even if, it, even if it's just a decent golfer. A lot of you probably know who Ludwig is. Um, and if you don't, he's quite a large YouTuber and one of the most successful Twitch streamers of all time. The other day I was listening to him do an interview with a psychologist named Dr. K, who you might've heard me rave about in my last video. He told Dr. K that he had dreams of being a professional Super Smash Brothers competitor and seriously considered grinding to become the best player of, of his choice of character and win big tournaments and all this. And he said something profound that actually came very natural to me, to be honest. Yeah, also I do this thing sometimes where if I want something, I just think of having the thing and then I feel good and then I don't try to pursue the thing. I, I want it to way. be the best Smash player in the world. And then while practicing to be the best Smash player in the world, I would think about being the best Smash player in the world and like what it'd be like to win and like everyone would be like, you're the fucking best and like holding a trophy. And then that felt good. And then I would stop pursuing the very long, boring, tiresome road of actually doing that thing because it felt good enough to get a little crumb of what that thing was like. And I was surprised to hear Dr. K say that his mind was completely blown. Like he had never really thought or considered that playing out a fantasy like that in your head could allow you to let go of your ambitions and, and focus on the things that really matter to you. But to me, it makes perfect sense. For example, when I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't want to be a YouTuber. YouTube didn't even exist when I was a kid. <laughs> I wanted to be an astronaut. I loved space. I loved learning about the planets. I saw blue marble and, uh, you know, those other photos of Earth from space. And I would just stare at them. And I think about how those photos captured like all of the entirety of human existence at once. And for a long time, I really wanted to experience that sight for myself. But as I got older and other things piqued my interest and I learned more about just the intensity of astronaut training and 
uh, dear God, the math involved, and really just more about what an astronaut actually does on the day to day. I accepted without even really having to think about it that I just was never going to go in that direction. Looking at astronomy photos started to satisfy the desire instead of cultivate it. And I started to put more of my focus into what mattered most to me at the time. I'm sure in another life I would have made an excellent astronaut, but playing astronaut as a kid was probably more fun than I would ever have actually being an astronaut. Sorry that I keep bringing up my last video if you haven't seen it yet, but uh, in that video we talked a little bit about Dharma and the idea that we all have a voice or like a compass in our head, whether it's our, it's our conscience or our subconscious or our soul or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that guides us in the pursuit of a fulfilling and harmonious life, right? What that calling draws you to won't necessarily be something that comes naturally to you. Like Dr. K ended up becoming a psychiatrist after getting like a 2.5 GPA in college or something like that. In fact, most careers and even just creative pursuits are complex and multifaceted enough to challenge your weaknesses no matter where they are. The otherwise greatest doctor in the world might suck at telling patients bad news. The greatest teachers will always have to adapt their preferred teaching method to each student. The singer with the most beautiful voice might write cheesy ass lyrics. Even if you aren't the best at any given thing you choose to pursue, you're most definitely going to bring something to the table that no one else does. My friend Isaiah and I started learning guitar at pretty much the exact same time, and he can move his fingers much quicker, and he can hit pinch harmonics and do cool techniques that I still can't do after a few years of practice. But I came to learning guitar with a background in music already, and so instead of trying to force my slow and clumsy fingers to shred, I instead focus on my melody and having tighter rhythms and things like that. When it came to YouTube, I didn't start out particularly good at just about any aspect of making videos. I've actually lost count of the number of times I've quit YouTube. I, I don't know how many channels I've created in my lifetime. Like this is probably my 10th channel or more, maybe. I'd record videos in my bedroom with my, my voice, you know, super low and whispery so my family or roommates didn't hear me talking to myself. And I still find it harder to record videos if someone else is home. But no matter how many times my channels didn't live up to my goals or expectations, I found myself pulled back in by a new idea or ambition to make videos I thought were cool. It's probably not a good idea to put your ambitions and everything you have into stuff that clearly isn't going to work out for you. Just like I had to give up the idea of ever being a golf or ping pong champion. But you're always going to develop taste before you develop skill. And so whatever you choose to do, you're gonna suck at it first, whether it's coming naturally or not. Shakespeare didn't pop out the womb knowing how to speak, let alone how to write beautiful poetry, right? Jimi Hendrix didn't pop out the womb knowing how to play guitar. And I didn't pop out the womb knowing how to beat this boss. The important thing is that you continue to learn and you continue to grow and you don't let setbacks or a quote unquote lack of talent keep you from doing that. I'm a full-time independent creator and recently I've stepped back from editing videos for clients to focus on empowering more creators and people who don't know yet that they're creators to pursue their passions. If you're interested in supporting my mission or you're interested in getting more support from me and my community, can Consider visiting my website and becoming a member of the Neat Club. And if this video made you feel something, share those feelings with me in the comments. I've read and replied in some way to every comment that was left on my last video, where you can learn more about leading a creative life and should be on screen now. I'll catch you next time.